Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's uh, webinar, uh, ongoing series, Agricultural Situation Market, uh, uh, Situation Market Outlook. Uh, same format as usual. Uh, we'll have a series of presentations, questions at the end. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat tool uh, to ask questions. We're very much encouraged. Uh, today, we have the four of us on. So we'll begin with Brian Parman, Egg Finance Specialist, continue with Frank Olson, uh, Tim Petrie, and then myself, then take questions at the end. But with that, we'll turn it over to Brian. Okay, so last week, the end of last week, uh, USDA came out with their their latest net farm and net cash farm income uh, projection for 2024. And they do two of these every year. They do one in February. And then they do one at the beginning of September, end of August, uh, where, where the, and they, they go back and update their forecast from the previous one. And so what I'm doing here is I'm showing you on the left is the February. If you look down at the lower left corner of the chart, very, very bottom left corner it says data as of February 7th, 2024. And then the one on the right, same, same lower left corner says data as of September 5th, 2024. So the one on the right is the latest that came out last week. And this one was was a bit unique from the standpoint that typically uh, the revisions to the previous uh, estimate are not as dramatic as they was in the, as they were in this last one. So if you look at the February 2024 report, so the one from about six months ago or so, uh, 2023 net farm income was projected uh, uh, 160 billion dollars. And then 2024 projected at 116 billion. So you see on that right hand side, and net farm income is the kind of teal green uh, line, the lower one. Yeah, and you, you see it there. And then if you look on the right, the August 24 report, 2023 was revised down nearly $10 billion. Okay, so in 20 in February, they were thinking it was going to be about 160 million to close out, you know, last year. And because of the fact that there was a lot more corn that wasn't priced like they thought, or not just corn, but crop, a lot more crops, a lot of it was corn though, that hadn't been priced yet because prices were falling. They wound up having to go back and revise how how well they thought we did in 2023 from 160 to 150 billion. But then there's some good news on, on this as well though, that the projection for 2024 back in February, so six months ago's projection for this current year, was 116 billion for net farm income, and right now they are they have revised it up recently to 140 billion. So, you know, a 24 billion dollar increase to net farm incomes nationally uh, compared to what they were thinking was going to happen six months ago. And the biggest reason for that, I'm going to skip forward real quick, is because uh, the the quantity, okay. Uh, the quantity change. So yields this year in 2024 are higher than you know back in the winter time what they projected yields were going to be uh the prices obviously a big reason for for the for the decline in net farm incomes from 23 to 24 you know the vast majority of it is price change uh but the quantity change being positive offset that and that's that's a big reason why that 2024 number is better than they thought it was going to be and then if from the same report we look at cash receipts for for the major u.s crops and, you know, it's it's pretty just about across the board, with the exception of like vegetables, uh, corn down from, you know, 80 billion to 64 billion, soybeans down from 59 to 50 billion and, and wheat down from 13 billion to 11 and a half. And as not only just as a percentage, but just as a nominal number, that drop in, in projected cash receipts in, in corn is, is just a really big number and explains a lot of why the net farm income drop has happened uh, or is, is happening. On the, on the flip side, livestock side though, USDA is showing that, you know, cattle and calves uh, receipts for that are up, you know, six and a half billion dollars. Dairy, uh, you know, incomes are up. Uh, broilers, hogs are up slightly, and then eggs as well. So the livestock sector uh, has been a been a kind of a different story across the board relative to the crop sector into 2024. A big reason for that being strong demand, as Tim will talk about, I'm sure later on, but also strong prices throughout the year. That that everyone just just about everyone had an opportunity to take advantage of that. Now on to government payments and the and the uh, program payment outlooks for this. 2024 season. 
Uh, not much. All right. You look all the way out there on the right, the gray bar there. That's just all other payments, sort of a catch all uh, market facilitations gone. Like you see that there was some of that in 2020. That's gone. Uh, non USDA pandemic assistance. That would have been the uh, those loans, you know, PPP loans. Uh, that's, of course, gone. Pandemic assistance obviously is gone. They still put it up there because it was a big part of 2020. And then if you look at uh, conservation payments, really, uh, that makes up the bulk of it. Other and conservation payments. Payments as a function of crop prices, which would be sort of a you know, darker green, just a very narrow strip across there, in indicating that 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 as we as we're aware, there's there's really not going to be much in the way of ARC or PLC coming down the line for government program payments this year. And then the flip side to that has been uh, so commodity prices have really really fallen off. But we look at production expenses and which peaked, uh, the bottom is the, the nominal price, peaked in 2022. And they've come down some, but not nearly enough to offset the drop in prices we've seen since 2022, which is, again, pretty much justifying it or explaining that big drop in net farm incomes over the last couple of years. With the caveat that the strong yield numbers expected for 2024 is going to offset that a bit. Not enough, but a bit, all right? And then as we break down these production costs and, and the contributions to uh, how they've moved from 23 to 24, labor costs tend, are continuing to increase. Uh, the purchase of animals in the livestock sector, livestock and poultry purchases, high, high calf prices means, you know, if you're buying calves or you're buying replacements, higher prices. Interest expenses have gone up as well as property taxes and fees. Again, feed purchases coming down. Fertilizer down slightly, seed pretty much no change, pesticide very little change, fuel and oil about the same, maybe slight decline, and then rents uh, pretty pretty much a constant 23 into 24. So by and large, you know, a lot of this is confirming what we knew was going to be true, that 2024 was going to be a weaker year than, 20, than 2023 was, uh, substantially weaker. But not as not as not as bad as they thought it was going to be heading into the planting season. And again, that's primarily because yields are going to probably beat X. They're expecting it to beat expectations. On the other hand, and, and Frayne's coming up next and he can talk about it. That doesn't necessarily bode all that well for prices heading into the 2025 year. Right. And these production costs are not expected to come down uh, all that much. Um between now and, and next planting. Sure, we could see some movements. And those of you who come to things like our Ag Lenders Conference this fall and other, other talks that I'll deliver, I'll dive deeper into things like equipment and fertilizer and, and fuels and everything else and land rents and land prices. But right now, there's just not a, a whole lot of pressure that we're seeing outside of used equipment of downward pressure on these production costs heading into next spring. So with that, uh, yes, we were around uh, at the end to answer any questions that you have uh, that you can put in the chat. And I believe our next speaker is Dr. Frayne Olson. And I have stopped sharing and I'll go ahead and mute, shut this down. All right. Thank you a lot, Brian. Uh, let me share my screen really quick here. Um, OK, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time and taking take some effort today to be able to, to visit with us. Um, I'm, I apologize, for, you know, for missing last month. Uh, I had some travel conflicts that just I couldn't couldn't get around to work out. So um, I'm actually uh, broadcasting from a hotel room today. <laughs> so again, I'm on the road traveling, but I was able to work out and, and be able to visit with you. So I'm going to talk about the uh, September WASD and production report that came out at about 11 o'clock this morning. Um, just some key market issues, some things. And, and again, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to try and answer those at the end. Um, just a very, very quick verbal recap. So the, the WASD report and the production reports this morning, uh, slightly positive for corn, and I would call it neutral for soybeans and wheat. If you look at just the numbers in the WASD and the, and the, and the, the, the production reports. Um, now, obviously, there's some other things happening globally that we need to be paying attention to. And so just because the prices move during a WASD day or a USDA release day doesn't mean that all, that all came from the USDA reports. So I just want to keep that in mind.
Um, a couple of things we'll talk about a little bit later to try and wrap this up and, and look forward a bit on what are some of the things moving forward that we need to be watching for that need that that I think the market is paying attention to um, some things that, that, that are developing. Uh, one of them, ex extended weather forecast is uh, still favorable for U.S. corn and soybean development. Um, I'll show you that in just a little bit. Um, there really isn't any major issues on the horizon. Uh, crop condition ratings can continue to come in very favorable. Yeah, we've seen some adjustments and slippage a little bit, but it's it's very marginal. I mean, there's, the crop is still going to look like it's going to be a very, very good production year. One of the things that has been developing, it's now kind of hitting the ag news a bit more, is the Mississippi River levels are dropping again. So again, because of the limited rainfall that we're seeing, in particular in kind of the southern part of the Mississippi River uh, Basin, um, we're seeing those river levels drop. Um, there are concerns now that there might be some barge shipping problems. So a lot of the corn and soybeans that, that go from kind of that Midwest region, the Iowa, Illinois, um, even Indiana, Ohio, down the Ohio River, the Illinois River, and even in, into parts of Kansas coming from the um, Arkansas River into the Mississippi River Basin, rely very heavily on the barge traffic. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, I'll, I'll show you some numbers in a minute. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is if this continues to be a problem, if this extends well into the harvest period and we start to see more and more shipping issues, uh, we might, and this is an emphasis, might see a shifting from some of those loadings or the vessel loadings out of the U S Gulf the Gulf of Mexico, actually being diverted and shipping out of the PNW. We saw a little bit of that that happened two years ago. Uh, not too much that happened last year because river, river levels did rebound in time that we didn't see any major disruption. So I'll talk about that in more detail in a second. Um, and then the other thing that, that is just now again starting to appear is when you get into southern Brazil, into Paraguay, Uruguay, um, and, and then into Argentina, the Paraná River, which starts into Brazil and drains into Argentina, is also getting very low. So the Paraná River is very important for Argentinian, uh, both soybean as well as corn exports. Because just like the, the Mississippi, the ocean vessels can go partway up that river to be able to be loaded. And a lot of the load, loading facilities for both soybean oil, soybean meal, as well as corn export shipments are loaded up river. And so just like, or very similar to these barge problems, the Argentinian uh, vessel uh, loadings are starting to slow. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay, so let's talk about what is what is the report, what does the report look like? Um, as I've done in the past, the top row on the very, very top highlighted in blue is what the um, average trade estimate was coming into the report. So this is what the professional traders and analysts were expecting the number to be out of today's report. Uh, the black line towards the bottom, the highlighted black line, is, is last month's um, reported number. And then, of course, the red on the very bottom is what we got today. Usually what I say is we need to compare the blue line to the red line because the blue line is that and those numbers are kind of built into the futures market. So when we get the new reports, the new numbers, it's not necessarily what happened last month, but it's what the trade is expecting to see. Okay, so this is, we got updates for both corn and soybean production. Um, <clears throat> the harvested acreage numbers keep tweaking a little bit. We did include that this time. At this stage of the game, most people are watching the yield and yield numbers very closely. The reason the September report becomes important is because that's when USDA NAS, National Ag, Ag Statistics Service, which is the ones that try and keep track of acreage and yields, include one more source of data into their forecasting. So up until this point, they've been using farmer surveys. So what are the farmers seeing and what are they expecting to see? They're using what they call remote sensing or satellite imagery to try and get an estimate uh, to validate or at least confirm what the farmers are telling them. And now in September, they add a third source of information. They actually send, they hire um uh, consultants, or they hire people to go out into randomly selected fields within each of the major corn producing, corn and soybean producing states. And they actually do yield counts, very similar to what a crop adjuster would do. So they go out into a selected area to a selected spo a spot in that field. And they say, look, based on what we see, what is the actual estimate for yield? So they're using three data sources now to try and compile that and say, what do we see coming 
not only national average yields, but then also yields per state. Now, we don't have time to go through the statewide numbers. Um, by looking, I want to start with the yield information. We'll start with corn. This 183.6, which is a slight increase from last month, okay? But also the surprise, I think, to the market was they were actually expecting that on average, that number to go down a little bit based on crop condition reported reports, based on some, some weather problems starting to show up it basically in the southern uh, producing regions for corn. The, the trade was kind of expecting USDA to start nicking down that number a little bit. Uh, they didn't do that. They actually increased the number just slightly. Now, that wasn't necessarily shocking news. Um, I'll show you what the what the market responded and how that worked out here in just a minute. But it was enough to kind of continue this trend. It's like, well, yeah, we're going to have a big year this year. Okay, so when we look at the at the uh, harvested acreage numbers, it really didn't change from last month. Um, they were expecting a slight trimming, um, I think, mainly because of some additional corn silage chopping for some of those um, mid and lower yielding corn cornfields. Again, whether that happens or not, I don't know. Um, so total production numbers, you multiply a harvested acreage times yield, you'll get the production number. It did go up a little bit from last month. Um, and again, the trade was expecting neutral to slightly lower. So that's the, the slightly negative tone in today's report. For soybeans, you start comparing the blue to the red and very, very small changes. No change in the yield, really no change on the harvested area. Uh, the difference between the production numbers from last month to the, this month, I think, is really just basically rounding error. They made some very, very small changes. They, I think they rounded down a little bit for this 153.2 here. Oh, no, they rounded up for the 152 here. They rounded down for the 152 here. So I think there's just some small changes in the yield, carrying out some decimal points, definitely within the margin for error. So when we look at ending stocks. Now this is for old crop. This is the amount of grain left in the bin from last year that we still have to market for this year. Okay, so we're not quite done with the end of the marketing season. Now, September 1 is theoretically the end of the corn and soybean marketing years. However, as of September 12th, we don't have all the official numbers. So we don't have like the closeout Think about it from an accounting standpoint, we don't have the closeout numbers yet for the corn and soybean numbers. So we will get, be getting those soon. Um, as of October, we'll have the, these official September numbers and we'll have everything closed out because we still have to do the September uh, um, um, ending stocks number or the September quarterly stocks number. My point is USDA starting to kind of trim up, if you will, starting to finalize and refine their, their estimates now at the very end of the marketing year for the total consumption of grain by area. And the one thing that they did this month for old crop inventories, they actually increased the ethanol uh, consumption of corn by about 15 million bushels and the increased exports by about 40 million bushels. Now, again, we're not, those aren't the official closeout numbers, but they are starting to kind of trim this up and modify and, and finalize their numbers. So we did take ending stocks, the amount of grain from last year going forward into this year, down just a bit. Again, not dramatically. So we took old crop inventories down a little bit. We increased the size of the crop this year. So the net for ending stocks this year will be up a little bit. I'll show you that number in just a moment. On the soybean side, again, really basically tweaking. There really wasn't any major changes or shifts in the old crop numbers. So the came in almost identical to what the trade was expecting. So let's go to the new crop numbers. And again, this would be the crop that we, for, for wheat, the crop that we're just now finishing harvesting, the crop for corn and soybeans that we will harvest in, in about a month or so. Okay, now this is again the forecast projection for ending stocks. How much are we going to have? in the bin left over about this time next year. Okay, comparing the blue number to the red number, really the wheat was basically pushed. No change in uh, new crop wheat numbers at all on the production nor the consumption side. There was a small change in the ending stocks. And part of that again is because we cut the amount of corn from last year moving forward, but we increased the amount of corn we're gonna produce this year. So the net change was relatively small. Okay, and then the same thing for soybeans. 
Again, we didn't really change the numbers for product production this year, nor the consumption from last year. So unlike many years, the September report was really very, very quiet, kind of a yawner, right? There really wasn't a lot of new information, no shocking value. In my opinion, kind of a nice, <laughs> a, a, for once, a nice September report. We don't have to really stress over this too much. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Mississippi River value, uh, river levels. Um, there are a few places where the National Weather, Weather Service, just like the Red River in Fargo, where they monitor and measure what are the river levels. And now, unlike the, the Red River in Fargo and Grand Forks, we're always worried about flooding. In the Mississippi River, we're always worried about low water levels. So when you look at the shaded brown area, that's actually, that's what they call low. It's defined as three feet or five feet below normal levels is where they say, is saying, well, we're going to start to have now some troubles with the usage and transportation and basically use of the river system and in particular transportation. So notice the dotted line towards the middle right here. That is today's date. This is taken as of this morning at seven o'clock in the morning. So this was, this was the river level as of seven o'clock this morning. Going backwards in time, you can see what the river levels have been at. Now this is at, um, excuse me, this is at uh, Memphis, Tennessee. That's one of those uh, kind of key points that we monitor as far as lower river levels, um, the lower Mississippi river levels, if you will, not the upper Mississippi like in, in Minneapolis, okay? Um, and then the, these dots, the the is the forecast moving forward so even even though hurricane francine is going to be hitting the gulf coast here pretty soon and starting to march up following the mississippi river into kind of the central part of the us and dumping a lot of rain i know there's some areas that are going to have some some localized flooding that amount of water at least based on current forecasts and projections out of the national weather service are not really going to have a significant impact on river levels in the mississippi river Okay, so that forecast for Francine, the hurricane, is already embedded in these forecasts here. So it's going to take a lot more than one flush of rain or one hurricane that dumping a lot of rain in selected areas to really start increasing the water flow. So as we move through the rest of September and into October, November, December, which is a really heavy, heavy shipping months for U.S. export season, we have to be watching this pretty closely. Okay, now what are we seeing in barge freight rates? And again, this is from the USDA Grain Transportation Report. So every week we get an update. Um, the updates come on Friday. So this information is from last Friday. This is on um, the, excuse me, um, this is for uh, the rates, excuse me, sorry. This is for the rates, the cost. So that blue line in the middle is the three-year average cost by week. So for, for that particular week, for the last three years, what was the average barge rate? Okay, And then the bars represent the barge rates, the costs that we're seeing today. So for this time of year, we are seeing that the barge freight, the freight rates for barge traffic on the Mississippi River are starting to increase and increase slowly. And again, this is anticipation of the, the not only the larger crop coming and a lot of grain starting to move into the export market, but also the fact that those uh, barges may not be able to haul as much grain. So the first thing that happens is when the river levels drop, they start reducing the amount of grain that's filled into each of the barges so that it rides a little higher in the water. It's the draft isn't as low because they have to worry about going around sandbars and other possibilities that don't want to run aground. And then the second problem, or if it continues to be a major, major issue, is sometimes you'll actually shorten the tows. They won't put as many barges into one bundle. And the reason they, they're shortening that, or if they do this moving forward, it's because the sandbars are getting big enough and obvious enough that they have to go around all these obstacles. And it's more maneuverable to have a shorter tow. So there's two possible adjustments that the industry might make as we move forward. Again, this is a developing story. It's something that we're going to have to be paying attention to. When we look at actual shipping volumes, again, this is from the Grain Transportation Report. This is as of last Friday. So these are last week's numbers. What's nice about this graphic is it shows the volume shipped, not necessarily the cost, but what's the volume shipped by grain class. And so again, that black line is the three-year average of shipping volumes. 
you can see we have these seasonal patterns in shipping. And you can also see what today's numbers are, which is the bar, uh, the bars relative to that three-year average. Okay, so we are have been seeing for the last several weeks some above average shipments as farmers begin to clean out their bins and it's trying to push that, that grain through the system. But seasonally, we start to see things dropping off coming into harvest. And once that harvest rush hits, Again, more of an explosion. We saw the same thing happen last year. If you go back into time, we get into this October, November, December time frame, where we start to see shipping um, shipping levels increase. So, this is going to be a not only a supply issue but a demand issue. Are we going to be able to have enough demand base? There can be enough export volume to really have those lower water levels create significant transportation issues. We don't know yet. Talking about weather, again, I'm not a weather forecaster. I don't pretend to be one. If you want really much better weather forecast, you need to talk to Daryl Richardson. However, I do lean on the uh, National Weather Service, and I know this information is followed by a lot of the market analysts and traders, and so we do have to pay attention to it. Now, this is average temperatures. This is the 6 to 10-day forecast. It is looking like, at least here in the Northern Plains, that we're going to have above average temperatures. And I know for a lot of farmers, that's kind of a sigh of relief that we're finally getting some heat. Hopefully, we'll be able to accumulate enough heat units later in the season to be able to get both uh, soybeans, but more importantly, corn into a position, at, at least into maturity. We get the black layer, and hopefully we have some time for a dry down so we don't have to spend a lot of money on drying costs or drying charges and propane. So this is looking very favorable for continued crop development. When we look at uh, precipitation and precipitation forecasts, it also looks like we're going to be able to pick up some rain showers. So the warmer temperatures looks like, hopefully, crossing fingers, we'll also be able to get some additional rain, again, to try and help finish out the crop, in particular for soybeans, to help those top pods be able to fill completely, hopefully bringing the top end of those, those soybean projection, yield projections up just a little bit. But again, when we look at the USDA forecast, when we look at private forecasters and what they're looking for yield and yield expectations, there really isn't anything, especially from a drought standpoint, that we're really concerned about at this point. Okay, so what's happening now in the futures market? This, These are charts that I pulled up um, as of about 12.30, just before I came online. Um, I've changed my, my, my format here just a little bit. I do want to explain this very quickly, and then I'll stop and, and kick things over to Tim Petrie. So the black line obviously is the current futures market. That's the current prices going back over the last several days. The red line, the one that runs through the middle, is the 20-day moving average. So we're looking at the last 20 days and saying, what is the average price we've seen? And kind of what's the, what's the normal range, the normal amount of volatility? So the, the red line is the 20-day the, the, uh, moving average. So that, think of that as the midpoint. The blue lines is plus or minus one standard deviation. And don't worry about how that's calculated, but just think about the, the upper and lower blue lines is saying that's the normal range. We always have some variability, but one standard deviation that about two thirds of the time prices will be in that range if we assume you know, the distribution of prices is normal, which we usually do. Okay, so think about the blue lines being kind of that normal range. And then the green lines, still being kind of more of extremes. So that the blue, green line is plus or minus two standard deviations or thinking about about 95% of the time, prices will be somewhere in between there. Now I use this as another kind of indicator, not only of, you know, are we are based on the last 20 days, are we kind of above average, below average? What's the trends? What do we see happening with volatility? So if you notice what's going on today, this is as of 1230, it looks as though we still have a little bit of upward drift. The red line, the average is still kind of drifting upwards. Looks like we have a little bit of a recovery. I would say it's a weak recovery because the today's prices are kind of in between the red line and the top blue line. Uh, going back a few days, we had a nice strong recovery because we were touching the green line, which is a bit more aggressive expansion or increase in prices. So based on this information, even though we had a, a, a pretty rapid drop in prices just as the report came out, since then we've had a recovery to numbers that we've seen about the last several days. So even though I, it looks as though prices are kind of shifting sideways based on what we've seen the last about month, you know, we're, we're still in that kind of slightly above average. I think we have a weak uptrend. 
Looking at soybeans, looking at this kind of the same kind of analysis. Yes, we're still above the average. We're still above the blue line, but we're between, excuse me, the red line. We're between the red line and the, and the top blue line. Again, we have a kind of a, a slow upward, uh, uh, kind of a weak upward pattern is the way I would define that. And then when we look at the wheat numbers, now this is for spring wheat. Um, we've been in that kind of that same mode where we had kind of a, a weak upward trend. Today, we're starting to see a little bit more volatility. Um, and I do think some of that is because there was an ocean, uh, excuse me, a grain vessel in the Black Sea that was actually hit by um, by either a drone or, or a, a rocket um, over uh, overnight. And so that that put a little bit of a kind of a oomph into the wheat market saying, well, oh, wow, we're going to have some more. Uh, in particular, wheat vessels or corn vessels in the Black Sea that were going to have some problems in the shipping. So I do think that that's really the reason that we saw a little bit of a pop in the um, in the in the wheat market today. So with that, I am completed my comments, um, and I will turn things over to Tim Petrie, and I'll be looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Great to be with you. Uh, just a couple themes that I'm going to talk about today. First of all, how resilient and adaptive the beef industry is in producing beef. And so uh, more on that. Uh, over time, I've shown you that slide where, you know, beef cow numbers have been declining since 1975. And yet beef production has been going up and, you know, all time record high in 2022. We're off a little bit from that, but more on just uh, what's happening this year. So very different ways that we produce a, a lot of beef. So that's going to be the big theme. And then the other theme is uh, that uh, simply the, there's that old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so you'll hear me mentioning that as we go along. So first of all, a lot of times I do start off with fed steer prices. And so, uh, you know, again, my color coded charts are all the same. The red is this year, light, the blue is last year. Purple is either for these cattle charts is 2022 and the green is 2021. For a lot of the other ch charts, the purple is just a five year average. And so, um, you know, focusing just to, overall in this chart, again, you, as most of you are well aware, we've been increasing uh, cyclically year after year because our beef cow herd has been declining year after year, and this will be our sixth year of decline. And so let's just focus on that top uh, red line there, which is fed steer prices have been cyclically a little bit higher than they uh, were last year. And uh, now we're seeing some some uh, seasonal decline and we're really right at where we were last year. So that goes back to more things change. There have been a lot of things happening in the cattle industry, both on the demand side and on, you know, in lower supplies, but we are basically there at 182 on fed steers, the same price who, that we were last year. Now, everybody's saying, uh, you know, our cow herd is down, so aren't supplies lower? And it isn't the number of cows we have, it's the amount of beef we produce that's that's important. So, uh, and the other thing is, you know, why, you know, why, can't, why aren't, why aren't prices higher? If, if our if our beef cow numbers are down. But again, we need to look at production. So um, we're right back where we started. I think, uh, you know, uh, we'll be able to follow at least last year's prices on out. The futures market is a little bit more pessimistic. Not although we've seen, you know, the futures took a big hit here the last month or so, but this week, uh, uh, fed cattle are up 350 and on the feeder cattle side, they're about, up about uh, $8 this week. So there is some spark back in the market there. And uh, so then, you know, looking to next year are those gold bars and the futures market still is being, being very pessimistic for next year. Uh, at below the, at below this year's prices and even 
or even into the summer and so on, even below last year's prices. And there's a lot of concern by futures market traders and by the big funds of the demand for beef that, you know, with high credit card debt and inflation and high interest rates and all the things that Brian uh, talks about, uh, you know, we'll see in a minute, beef prices are high and, and all that. I think that we will do better than the futures market is saying. Um, Frayne just mentioned the WASDA report that came out today and uh, USDA that is usually pessimistic in predicting prices, particularly the further out. They're predicting next year's average Fed steer price at 186.25, which uh, would be above this year by a couple dollars, and it would be quite a bit above what the futures are. So we'll have to see and wait and see what happens. A lot of things can affect the market. But anyway, you know, we're right back kind of where we were la uh, last year at this time. So why is that the case? So that we'll get into that here in a minute. So the top then, uh, here's some reasons why we're at the same level as we were last year. The top is the boxed beef. I like to look at the boxed beef uh, cutout value because that's what packers can sell meat into the all the different uh, places they sell into the retail channels, exports and restaurants and, and stores and so on. And, you know, not surprisingly, then the beef cutout value is a last week was identical to what it was last year as well. Another reason why we would, we would be the same there, but there's good news there in that, you know, we have uh, very high retail prices and yet we are, uh, you know, able to, to uh, you know, keep that cutout value up, and and on the bottom, beef is moving. Uh, beef, beef and coal storage is again identical to what it was last year at below average levels. So, uh, beef is moving into the channels at at a, a good pace there, and we are clearing the market. So, uh, you know, here's retail beef prices, and again, they are at record high levels for beef. And obviously the the highest price commodity lamb isn't on here, which would be higher. But anyway, the others, uh, you know, in the case of pork and and, uh, you know, has leveled off. And Brian mentioned some of those numbers to begin with. And, you know, uh, uh, chickens, the broiler there kind of uh, have leveled off and, uh, you know, haven't increased a lot like, like he showed on his chart. And, but but. Beef prices are high, and yet we're clearing the market and 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 moving the market, and uh, and which is good news. Now, why we are at about the same level on prices again? It isn't the number of beef cows we have, but it's the amount of beef we produce. And back to my opening statement that the beef industry is very adaptive and resilient. Here's beef production, and the red line again is this year. And the blue line is last year. And we basically have the same amount of beef production uh, this year as we had last year, just one tenth of a percent down and a little bit below what it was, uh, you know, a couple of years ago because uh, of the record high in, in, in 2022. So we've got the same amount of beef production this year as last year, and we have the same prices as last year. So, uh, you know, all those going together. Now, uh, where we got the beef the last couple of years, you know, on the, on, again, there it's showing 22 was the all time record high in beef production. So what bolstered beef production the last several years was the bottom chart. We had, uh, you know, a high beef cow slaughter. We'll show you that in, in even more detail in a minute, high beef cow slaughter forced cow sales because of drought. So high beef cow slaughter added in and, 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 and supported uh, beef production. And however, this year uh, we are slaughtering a lot less cows so far, 16% uh, less cows. So they, the, beef, the cow sector and bull sector for that matter are pu putting less into beef production. And yet, as we saw before, beef production is the same as it was last year. So where is that coming from? And where it's coming from is fed steers and heifers. On the top chart then, again, there's that red line of beef carcass weights and they are 
have been except in January from then on when we see, usually see a big season of decline in the mid-year and then picking up. They did not decline seasonally and stayed up high and, uh, you know, are higher than they've been the last couple of years. And so that's where we're getting the additional beef from this year. Instead of cows, we're getting it from fed steers and heifers. You know, some reasons for that uh, is, is that, you know, packers will like to run a capacity and they're able to sell beef at record high prices. And so they are telling the feedlots to feed them longer. I just uh, know a feedlot that I talked to that usually uh, sells uh, cattle at the beginning of the, this was a month ago at the beginning of the month. And the packer said, let keep, keep them, uh, if you keep them a couple, three more weeks, uh, it'll pay off for you. Your cost of production, feed costs, of course, are lower than last year, uh, you know, and uh, we, we want them to be heavier. And if there are some heavy weights in there, if you're concerned about that, we're not going to discount them for it. We, we want, we need more beef through the channel. So feedlots are simply uh, feeding them to, to heavier weights and uh, you know, uh, below then again, we we have cattle on feed over 20 days that we've had, you know, at the beginning of the year even more than last year, and and so on. So that's what's giving us more beef this year are those um, uh, heavier weight uh, steers and heifers. And then on the export uh, side too, we're about the same as we were last year, right? We're always a couple months behind, but in July, we actually exported more than we did last year. Uh, in June, a little bit less, but, you know, on, kind of on the average, they're about the same. Again, adding into that similar fed steer price we have. But again, good news that we can, you know, last, last in July, we could export more given the high prices we have uh, for beef as well. So, on, you know, the demand side hanging in there. So then let's bring it back to what we're talking about now. We'll start off with these seven to eight hundred pound feeder steers and the price and so on. We're going to really, really get a good test of the market this week because just about every auction market in North Dakota is holding a special yearling sale this week. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, when the USDA report comes out on Monday, we will get, you know, a good range in prices and so on. Again, we've been sick, the red line, we've been cyclically higher most of the year, but now have had declined with fed cattle and so on. And those distant futures were fed cattle, uh, you know, coming under some pressure. Uh, again, right where we were last time, just like fed cattle. And, uh, you know, usually we do have seasonal weakness on these yearlings as we move into the fall season and calves hit the market and so on. And so, you know, I think we're, we're supported quite well there uh, at the same price as last year, like, like a fed cattle. And I know they were higher than that early in the year, and that might have been people's expectations. And, and I, again, I keep getting as we got fewer cattle, so we should have uh, higher prices. Is there some, uh, you know, something going on there? And, and uh, is it, is, you know, are, are, are the Packers or is it USDA or is it China or is it something else? And the answer is simply that we are producing the same amount of beef as we did last year and you saw fed cattle prices and so on. So uh, th that's kind of the story there. I think, you know, we can follow that blue line. Again, the feeder cattle futures have been under a lot of pressure here in the last month. And so when we go to next year with the gold bars, they're, you know, uh, quite a bit lower than the price now even, and again, I think that's just an overreaction to uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the live cattle futures that are lower too, that there's going to be a, you know, a big drop off in demand and so on. And so as, you know, as long as, you know, USDA's 186 on fed cattle and, uh, you know, holds true, which might even be conservative, I think we will do uh, better than that. But th that's, wh that's where the futures market is. So, you know, for backgrounding and selling in the market in April, it makes it kind of a tough uh, pre-pricing thing, whether you're doing LRP or whatever, because of those uh, lower futures there in, in January and, and March. Go to the calf market, kind of the same story there, cyclical higher, so, so on, uh, quite a bit higher there 
in the spring than we were the year before. We had uh, really, really good grazing conditions this year, uh, but they are worsening now. And so we had a really, really good demand for those lightweight uh, feeder cattle. Uh, you know, early in the spring, like we do sometimes when we have good forage conditions. And again, we've got a lower supply there. So they were higher in the summer, but, you know, again, we brought them down near where they were last year with the other market classes and always see the seasonal weakness, you know, October, middle of October, kind of a tough time to sell calves because there's so many coming to market. So again, I think we're supported uh, you know, uh, we uh, were at record high levels and last year were record high. And so that blue line of last year, you know, it, it would be a goal. And again, there's a wide, we're going to see that when the, we the, these market reports start coming out and more get to the market, a wide range. Uh, there'll be a wide range in calf price, probably for the same weight and grade of calves at the same market, a $30 or more range. And so, you know, what we're talking about is averages there. And so we'll sell some, you know, 10 to $20 higher than that blue line, maybe and some 10 to 20 lower, but that's, that's kind of an average, but I think we're supported at, as of now at last year's prices, which were, you know, at, at very respectable levels there. Then we go to cow prices, same thing there, you know, cyclically increasing. And, and because of that 16% off on beef cow slaughter, we were selling quite a few, uh, uh, fewer beef cows this year and so that's been supportive to prices and uh, but now the fall of the year is starting to be here and some pregnancy checking and the cows start coming to market so we always see that decline in prices and we've already started to see it happening here and uh and we expect that to continue to happen although to, to continue to be above where they were uh, last year by ten dollars or maybe more than that but we see a decline every week from now on out and again i always say you know uh, 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 producers tell me well i'm selling my cows for a lot more than 121 22 dollars i might be selling to 140 or 37 or whatever and so you know yeah i i realize that it's just like calf prices there's a wide range in dressing percentage of cows and there are higher yielding cows uh, selling for higher. There's a market report that just came out for, you know, the, uh, there's a, a cow up at there at 145 and so on. So mine tend to be the lower. These would be broken mouth. These lean cows would be broken mouth cows that have had a calf on them all summer. And and so they would be uh, a lean and maybe towards the lower end of the market. But the cow market is, you know, well supported there with the lower slaughter we have. Drought is moving in again, unfortunately, in the U.S. Back in June, only 6% of our beef cow herd was in a drought, and now it's getting dry in the Southern Plains and even up in the Appalachian states, although the Appalachian states are going to get better with the, uh, with the hurricane remnants and moving in there and you know Kentucky and Tennessee have been dry but they're predicted particularly up into Tennessee to get some aftermath of the the hurricane that's that's uh, hitting New Orleans and stuff so maybe they'll improve but you know we're up to the drought monitor just came out this morning up to 29 percent of our uh, cows in and drought again up up from just six percent back in June so you know there's uh there's a concern there with dry weather western a lot of western North Dakota is dry and getting drier down into South Dakota and so on so something to watch there so with that I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Dave Great, thanks, Tim. Uh, so I just wanted to cover a couple of things uh, this month. Uh, first is a question I get somewhat regularly, uh, especially when visiting with farmers across the state, uh, regarding the potential impacts of how we're inter how we're addressing climate and what that might mean to crop production. And so the, the question is, essentially goes along the lines, are we gonna run out of CO2? Is there gonna be enough carbon for me to uh, have, have uh, my 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 crops produce uh, and so forth. Uh, it, it's a really interesting question, um, and, and I get it enough that I thought that I'd address it here this month. Uh, I'll walk through a few different steps and then get to the answer. Uh, the first chart is one that you may or may not have seen, but it's very common in, in the, the the climate world. And so this is uh, the parts per million of CO two atmospheric CO two. 
And so this 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 kind of uh, steady increase uh, beginning, you know, really with the Industrial Revolution and kind of post World War II, uh, the increased use of fossil fuels to uh, to power our economy resulted in much of this. But again, one thing to notice is that it's certainly increasing. The other, if you actually look at the scale on the left, you can see that we've gone from this about 300, 320 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. That 400 number was one that has been set by climatologists as being where uh, they call it, in some respects, the point of no return. And we've we've clearly exceeded that. Um, but a substantial increase. And again, if we do quick math, you know, we've increased the amount of atmospheric CO2 in the last 60 years by uh, about 30 percent right so a, a pretty pretty significant increase um kind of stepping back or kind of adding to this talking quick about the carbon cycle uh carbon cycle is is pretty complex there's a lot of different things going on in agriculture we're very much a part of this because we make use of photosynthesis uh to to, to draw our crops uh to produce forage to, you know, provide that growth in pasture and the like, uh, you know, all the way through. That's that's really what we're relying on, really in the solar energy business, if you think about it in some respects. Um, but the big things to take away from this chart is, you know, where the increases, the net increases are coming from. And for the most part, what's happening is it's because we're using fossil fuels, because we're engaged in certain industrial processes, you know, we're re we're releasing a significant amount of carbon that had been stored geologically, primarily as, you know, oil, gas, coal, uh, as that's being used, that ends up in the atmosphere. And so we're making that increase, and that's leading to, to much of that steady increase we saw in the previous chart. There's other things that are going on uh, that work somewhat to balance this. There's other things that are going on where uh, they may or may not be impacted by it, but that's really uh, the big issue. And the, the the actual relative amount is actually significant. Again, if you think, you know, human activity has increased the amount of atmospheric CO2 by 30% in the matter of decades, it is pretty, pretty significant. Uh, the other thing you take note of, too, if we think about the carbon cycle, a lot of talk about the way that we grow our crops or the way that we uh, take care of our livestock, how that can end up increasing the amount of carbon in the soil. That's certain, certainly part of this as well. A lot of different things that we can do to either reduce emissions or to actually capture carbon. And so those are the, the, the main things that we look at. So in terms of reducing emissions, one of the big goals is decarbonizing transportation, decarbonizing the economy, using less fossil fuels, uh, no matter what in you know in any realistic timeline we're going to continue to use fossil fuels there's some some places where there's simply not a good uh, analog a, a decent replacement for it so we know that we're going to continue to have those emissions to reduce emissions or to reduce atmospheric carbon we can use uh, carbon capture and storage so carbon capture and storage refers both to capturing carbon from uh the use of fossil fuels, or it can also mean either bioenergy with carbon capture or direct air capture. That would be taking uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and then storing it uh, uh, in, in, in the geology. And so this brings up two different terms. Uh, the first is net zero. And if it, we think about this, this would be a, this is a very lofty goal of even achieving net zero. So this would mean significantly reducing emissions across the economy but then also having enough direct air capture and bioenergy production with carbon capture to offset those emissions that still take place. You know, that's a significant reduction in terms of what we currently emit, as well as this development of an additional industry or sector that's going to take that CO2 from the atmosphere and sequester it underground. If that happened, which is a very lofty goal, uh, that would simply flatten. You know that would that would leave us at whatever ever level that that would be achieved at. You know whatever f future year that would occur. And again, even if it happened now, the amount of CO two in the atmosphere would still be thirty percent higher than it was sixty years ago. The a lot of folks are interested in and have an even more ambitious goal of being that negative, and that would be where CO two 
uh, removal would exceed those emissions. And so that would simply be further reduction of em emissions and a further larger build out of carbon capture and storage. Um, but, you know, really under any plausible scenario, we're not going to get to a point where the, the amount of atmospheric CO2 is going to any way impact agricultural production. Um, and I think that's an important note. And again, a question I get quite a bit. Uh, another thing, you know, there's been a lot of uh, concern, you know, both both Brian and Frank talked about this, the state of the farm economy, farm incomes, uh, the s and Ds with, with a variety of different crops. And, you know, at this time, I just want to kind of revisit a couple of things that, that I think we all know now. You know, ethanol is a major home for U.S. corn. Uh, you know, you can see from the chart, it ends up being a, a, a major user. And again, we also get that that uh, that that kickback from the distillers grains also ending up in the feed market. But that that feed use and ethanol use, both very big numbers, but also within any with any short term horizon relatively fixed and you know corn prices would have to get very very low to actually induce ethanol prices to be so feasible that you'd, you'd want to push out like a a more affordable higher uh, ethanol blend it's really still uh, you know in the markets that's really a rarity where that happens it's typically priced as the oxygen it so that 10 percent blend still dominates we're not in that place where even though the prices are low at the farm gate, where the price of ethanol uh, is such that we'd actually see increased use of, of higher blends of ethanol. And of course, it'd be great to see exports of corn and or exports of ethanol. And of course, there's always efforts to do that. Just looking at uh, a chart from EIA. So this is just plant production. Uh, you know, and if we look, we can go back, you know, seven years now and, and the, the production levels in the United States have been relatively relatively consistent obviously fluctuations from week to week month to month season to season with a covid blip and, and some bad weather in there as well but we really don't have this 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 upward uh, opportunity that would be really nice at this time where we uh, might have uh, extra corn uh last thing i want to talk about is an announcement made by the california air resources board which has significant uh implications for for agriculture especially midwestern agriculture so carb is the regulator for the low carbon fuel standard they oversee uh the the creation implementation of the regulation one of the things they do regularly is look at the rules and come up with uh, possible changes towards them they go through a process to do that but one of the the proposals that they recently made you know about a month ago was to actually cap the amount of soybean oil and canola oil that could be used for biomass based diesel and at not only to do that but then to do it at a 20 percent level this to me is it's quite surprising uh the the reasoning behind it is that california wants to make use of oil that is somewhat extra right so it's a, it's a lower value coal product not to do the opposite which is to induce demand to actually have a significant demand pull which would change behavior which you can see in the construction of crush plants or the change of acreage um, and so this is the approach that they they're proposing to take we'll see if they move through with it uh, at all or at this level but it has really big implication and i did just put together a chart so you can see where we're actually at today. And so the, the data only goes through the first quarter of 2024, which is as far as CARB is released. But if we stack the canola and soybean oil based biodiesel and renewable diesel, we can see that we've actually already been dancing around this 20% level as it is. And to me, that's really, uh, it's certainly bearish. Uh, for where we might be going. Again, there's still this expectation that there would be an increase in the use of renewable diesel in California, uh, but that 20% cap would would certainly limit the, the growth opportunities there. You know, what offsets this significantly is California, even though it's the largest state, the largest market for transportation fuels, 
Other states, Washington and Oregon have it as well. All of Canada does. And so it, it's not as if there is a national cap at 20% or the that line that's drawn that we're very close to hitting in California necessarily applies anywhere else. Um, but to me, a, a somewhat unexpected uh, piece of news from, from Sacramento, which could have very large implications for biofuels, uh, the oil complex, crop prices, uh, and, and production egg here in the Midwest. So that's what I had for my remarks. Um, with that, I'm happy to open it up for questions for anyone. And I'd also bring up that if anyone has anything they'd like to add based on other people's presentations or their own thoughts, they're welcome to do that as well. And I also mentioned, I know Brian made note of it earlier, we are having our annual Egg Lenders Conference series a uh, little bit earlier, but the third week of October this year uh, in Grand Forks, Minot, Bismarck, and, and Fargo. And I should actually say the 25th for Fargo. Um, but that's that's coming up and there's more news. And I think almost everyone who's, who's subscribed to the webinar is also uh, part of the marketing for for this event, so you should you should definitely be hearing more news about this soon. Every, everybody's quiet, and if, if 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 none of the panelists are jumping up either, um, I think I think we'll call them up. Of course, you can you can still get a hold of us if you have some some questions that come up later, uh, and if not, we'll see you in October. Thanks. Mm -hmm.